Hello, I'm Nadira Hira, your MC for this year's SDG Global Festival of Action. And I'm so pleased to be here presenting you one of our very special Turning Point Dialogues. On the heels of a year full of challenges, a global pandemic marked by economic, political, and social turmoil, we've seen dramatic shifts in how we think about living and earning, consuming and producing. Things that were deemed too ambitious or expensive even to entertain before now seem not just doable, but downright imperative, which means that this incredibly difficult time may also be a potentially unparalleled opportunity to build a more just and sustainable society. So how? How do we, together, make this a true turning point for people and for planet? Here to consider the question with us is someone who's been a leader on human rights and environmental justice at the likes of Greenpeace, Amnesty International, and Africans Rising for Justice, Peace, and Dignity. Lifelong activist, mobilizer, and campaigner, Kumi Naidu. Kumi, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So let's just start. You are certainly no stranger to building movements in response to complex threats. So as we examine the power and possibility of making 2021 a turning point, is there anything about this moment based on your experience that makes it unique or especially crucial? And what opportunities do you see within this time of crisis, which of course includes the pandemic, but also a sweeping outcry for racial justice and the very real emergency of the climate crisis? This moment that we find ourselves in is being described in different ways. It's been called a perfect storm, a boiling point, a convergence of crises and so on. And that was before COVID. Now with COVID, COVID has exposed the deep inequalities that exist in society, the deep hypocrisies that exist. And as you correctly said, many of these investments that have suddenly been made now for years and years and years, we were told we could never find that kind of money to help the poor, right? But because the rich were a threat, right? COVID threatened rich and poor, so money had to be found to mm -hmm. protect the powerful. Let's be very clear that the poor have been supported through the pandemic, but the poor have suffered a, not just a double, but a triple tragedy in what they've had to endure. But this moment does provide real opportunity for change. If you look at 2008, 2009, after the global financial crisis, the response of our governments and businesses was, was system change, system, uh, sorry, it was system protection, system maintenance, system you know, recovery, right? But what was needed then and what's needed now is system innovation, system redesign and system transformation. And I think, I know no other moment in my history of activism over far too long, with too little to show for it, by the way. Not uh, far too long. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> for more than four decades. That's right. right. For more than four decades. What I feel is there's never been a moment as pregnant as possibility for us to go beyond incremental tinkering with injustice and problems, baby steps in the right direction, but to go to the heart of the need for us to redesign our society, to address inequality at the core, whether it's gender equality or the horrible way history has treated, uh, treated indigenous communities and so on. So overall, I think uh, there's no way but for us to actually make big change. I should say as an aside, one of the people I love most in the world is Mary Robinson. And Mary Robinson and I were on a panel early following the days of the pandemic, uh, started in April last year. And I said, uh, and she was saying, basically, there's absolutely no way we can go back to the, to the normal. To the mm -hmm. And I said, Mary, I want you to be right. But if I had 100 pounds to bet, I would bet that the forces of reaction and backwardness are the ones that will actually make sure that we go back to normal. So I would say to everybody, just because political leaders and business leaders are saying the right words are coming out of the mouth right now, history commands us not to take it at face value, right? Not to take it at face value. Thank you. So I, 
in on the one hand, it's deeply encouraging to hear someone like you who with four decades of experience in this space is saying this is an unprecedented moment um, and let's take advantage of it. That is encouraging. On the other hand, I think you're exactly right. We've had these moments before historically where we've said nothing, nothing will take us backwards from here. So, and yet here we are and here you are doing this work year in year and year out. So I guess the real question is what do you think needs to happen on both a systemic and individual level what actual major shifts need to occur right now so that you don't have to do this 10 and 20 and 30 years from now so that we actually do capitalize on the opportunity of this moment? Well, firstly, I think what we are seeing is an unprecedented mobilization of people standing up for the intersecting injustices that we face. Racial injustice, the climate crisis, deepening inequality, environmental collapse, and much more. So what you look at the landscape of resistance to injustice, it is a very rich and diverse tapestry from the amazing heroism of the people in Myanmar against the military junta to the most marginalized of communities all over the world standing up. So what we need to do as leadership is for us to back off, right? Create an enabling environment for new and fresh voices to actually be heard and followed. Uh, we have to be looking at new forms of organizing, right? Because I'm very influenced by a leader called Amilka Cabral, who was one of the anti-colonial leaders in Africa. And he always used to say, tell no lies and claim no easy victories. And at this moment of history, we have no luxury. We, we, we don't have the luxury of being too nice to each other. We need to be polite. Uh -huh. We need to be kind. We need to be compassionate. But we need to be honest. And let's be brutally honest that the situation we find ourselves in right now is that this decade is the most consequential decade in humanity's history. What we do in the next 10 years will determine what future we have, whether in fact we even have a future to talk about. And given all of that, it cannot be business as usual. And we need to take the wisdom of Albert Einstein, for example, when he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. In this inflection point, if there's one thing we must do is ask the question, what do we do differently? We cannot continue to have the same dependence on so-called voices from the global north. We cannot continue to have the sort of dependency on certain big branded organizations that have shown to be very weak in this current moment of pandemic, uh, racial injustice and economic crisis. So we need to be thinking about more decentralized movements and, and, and where people directly affected are the ones that are enabled to speak in their own voice. And this idea of privileged people prosecuting the struggle for people in poverty is just an old colonial idea that we need to push away, right? Absolutely. And, and unless we get people to speak in their own voice with their own eloquence, and let me just say something. If there's one thing I've learned, it is the poor, it is the marginalized, it is excluded, can speak with the greatest eloquence about what they are going through. None of us who have studied it and researched it and so on can ever speak. And, and, and when they speak and are enabled to speak, you see the impact much, much more powerful, especially if we can get those voices to be heard in the right places. And to your point, they're able to speak with power and honesty in a way that it would be impossible for anyone who hasn't had that experience actually to do. But we saw you speak on a panel um, yesterday where you talked about the power of people, but I thought very um, perfectly, you talked about talking about the power that people do have, what they can do rather than the opposite, because it's so natural for us to talk about everything that people don't have. Um, so I think when you're speaking to leadership, there's, there's one kind of guidance. When you're speaking to the actual people, the people that we're trying to enable, what, how do we harness that power? How do we pass that, practically speaking, enable them to, to make the kind of change we're talking about and really drive this forward for their own sake and for our collective sake as a human race? 
I think that what we are seeing is people are not waiting for anybody to tell them you should have more voice and so on. I mean, young people through Fridays for the Future and other uh, expressions of climate activism didn't wait for anybody, they took it. Absolutely. Right? And my urging, and, and you know, if you ask me who inspires me the most in constituency terms, I'd, I have to tell you, if it wasn't for the sort of bravery and the courage of young people, uh, which is one inspiration right now. And, and bear in mind, it's not just the bravery of standing up to uh, security forces not. But what inspires me is that young people are not contaminated by the horrible experience people of my generation are. And that contamination of experience means we cannot imagine another more just, a more inclusive, a more equitable world. And young people are bringing that in very powerful ways. And that inspires me. The second category of people that most inspires me is indigenous peoples. Right? Indigenous peoples around the world have suffered the most injustice and brutality, but their dignity, their courage, their persistence and so on has been, especially in this moment, some of the voices ancient wisdom is bringing to the current moment, because basically, let me say this very clear. If we think we're gonna sort the current problems out by old ways of thinking, and thinking there's nothing in ancient wisdom that we can draw on, then we're making a big, big mistake. If we followed some of the wisdoms of indigenous communities all around the world, we wouldn't be in the deep crisis that we are. And the third constituency that inspires me, of course, is the progressive women's movement. Uh, they have had to deal with the Trump uh, in the White House, Bolsonaro you know, in Brazil, and a whole range of sexist leaders who actually have no shame to project it because that's how they build the constituency somehow. So I think that we are seeing movements emerge, but I think part of the challenge is what we need today, the mistakes of the past that must be first, we need leaderful movements. We must not build movements around a couple of individuals. We must have decentralized movements so that if governments who are repressive move against us, they cannot crush us quickly. And we also need to recognize that the biggest challenge we face is not the repressive actions of the state. They're not the use of the army, the police, and the formal laws and all. Of course, they're very powerful and they hurt us sometimes really, really bad. But actually, the most powerful form of control is the ideological state apparatus the framework for education, the framework for religion, social norms and customs, and most critically, the framework for, for communications and media, right? And that's the biggest threat to us, actually, because and we, are, we can't break through the lies, the disinformation sufficiently. However, if we apply ourselves creatively to understanding all of these movements, I would argue must embrace what is now more and more being called artivism, right, which is the nexus between culture and art and activism, because mm -hmm. this is, and I say this mia kalpa number one, there are many words that have come out of my mouth or in writing that most of the people that it implied to would not have been able to understand. So unless we get movements to talk like our people talk, walk like our people walk, think like our people think, and not think in elite ways to deal with the elites on the other side. And, and it's not like anybody makes these mistakes out of willfulness. I understand it. All these mistakes, I like to believe are made in good faith, right? But I think it's important for people like me now to say, hang on a minute, if you follow exactly what we've been doing in these organizations for the next 10 years, we're not going to be very, very in a different place. So we got to We're not change. even in the same change conversation. Yeah, and change has to come also from the people that have occupied a lot of space in institutions that have not delivered the justice that those institutions sought to deliver in good faith. And they've had a lot of time now and they need to actually have the courage to create spaces for new decentralized, people-centered, more global South-led rather than global North-led type of movements. And, I'm, and in that, con and that context thing, many of even the progressive formations, which are very northern orientated and so on, will need to revisit if they are genuinely committed to a global equity where people share 
the resources, the thinking, and all that is on this planet. What I love hearing is that in a way for us to support these movements, it's, it's about talking about it. It's helping it to be communicated and to be spread um, and to, uh, to actually take hold um, so that we are, we're raising and broadening the footprint, which is a wonderful thing and is exactly why we're doing what we're doing here at the festival and what you do every day. Um, I mean, I do from your uh, mouth to the universe's ears. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to have you here with us at the Global Festival of Action. And we know we're going to be seeing plenty of you um, for years to come. So thank you. Thank you. It, it's been lovely. Thank you. And thank you to all the folks attending this festival and for all that they do. Thank you.